Welcome to the programme, a special one tonight. You know that in life at the moment, how frustrating it is. We're seeking a balance all the time, aren't we? And so we are on this programme. I did pop promise uh, Sheffield Wednesday supporters I'd balance things out. I, I'm sure our special guest this evening wouldn't mind me saying that I've been, so to speak, on his tail for quite a little time, but he has had rather a lot on his plate. I'd like to uh, wish a very warm welcome to Gary Monk, the manager of Sheffield Wednesday. How are you doing, Gary? Hi, Al. I haven't been avoiding you, I promise. <laughs> you told me just now that I looked less stressed. We haven't seen each other face to face for a long time. And I said to you, I, I wish I could return the compliment. <laughs> is, there ever, is there ever a time when you can take a breather? I noticed recently you were saying that since taking the Sheffield Wednesday job, you've not really had any time off at all. And here I am in an international break when, dare I say, you might just get a little bit of downtime occupying you. Uh, or is it just business as usual during an international break? No, business. We're at the training ground as I speak, just finished training. Um, yeah, I think what I mean by that is, of course, you have days off, so to speak. But even on those days off as a manager and as coaches and stuff like that, you're constantly still doing things, you know, whether that's analysis or planning, um, for the trainings that are coming up ahead and stuff like that. So it's never really fully effective a, a day off. It's not like you can just switch off and spend the whole day doing something else. So you've got to balance that up with family time. It's important. You know, I've got young kids and stuff like that. Try and dedicate some time to them. But even still, it's it's something you learn with experience um, to get better at, which I definitely have. But yeah, I don't think you ever fully switch off from a job, which is the, the probably the hardest part of it. Yeah. Young kids, how old are they? Yeah, I've got um, twin boys. Um, double trouble that are six and I've got a daughter that's nine so yeah they're very young um, still a lot of trouble um, as the missus reminds me every day so um yeah trying to balance that that's a big yeah I think what's it six nearly six years I've been doing this job now it's a huge turnaround to of sacrifice in terms of you know I, th I think people realize it's not that people want to know really but like anyone um, in these type of jobs yeah, it's a big sacrifice you put on your family, you know, whether that's moving around, whether that's time spent with them. Um, yeah, but that's part of the job and you try and balance that home life with, with your work. And um, it's very difficult. I remember when I yeah, first... Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, as well with the kids going back to school and the di yeah. disruption they've had in their lives during lockdown. It must have been a stressful time away from the job as well as in it. Yeah, well, I said it in the lockdown period to the missus. I said anyone that homeschools normally must be insane. Um, having the kids at home for 10 plus weeks was, um, yeah, it was a challenge. I said, um, I said to them, everyone, I think that first week I was probably the best PE teacher the kids have ever had. And then after that week, it kind of crumbled down to nothing. So, um, no, it's, it's good. Yeah, I try and spend as much time with them. Whenever I'm not working or in here or, or doing this job, I, I spend it with the family. But... As I said, even then, you've still got stuff going around in your head, what you need to do. and um, But it's just part of part of learning with the experience. And, and yeah, when you have a young family, it's, yeah, you've got to try and get that balance right. It's difficult, but, yeah, something I'm working on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And an escape from the hardest work, actually going back to work. Actually, yeah, I don't know which one's harder. I'm not sure which one's harder, especially with my kids, so I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can imagine. We'll leave that one there. Um the world at the moment seems like we're in a, uh, an alternative uh, universe. I mean, nothing seems seems real. There are no supporters in stadiums. I know you've got a view on that. Uh, Manchester City 2, Leicester 5. Manchester United 1, Spurs 6. Aston Villa 7, Liverpool 2. What do you make of all that? It's, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, I think there's no doubt about it having no crowd there is is just different totally different um the pressure of having a crowd there um is different i think that's really missing um and also what i noticed the most in these games is the games are still played at quite a good at the level of tempo and level of intensity still um but it's it's the get it's the moments of momentum that i've noticed the biggest difference that you don't have that crowd effect there whether that be momentum you're building in terms of you're on top or momentum where you've been behind and you maybe 
got something, you know, like a goal back or something, and that then normally where that crowd kicks in, I've, what I've noticed the most out of all yeah, is just the momentum shifts aren't there as much or they're not sustained as as much because they haven't got that crowd influence. That's where the fans play such a huge part in, in shifting momentum, whether that's good or bad. And um, that's the biggest thing I've noticed, and that's what I think is missing. I think, um, mm -hmm. and it will suit some players. Some players will enjoy not playing in, with that pressure because. You know, sometimes it can be difficult, you know, big clubs with expectation, you know, um, I've had that experience before with players where they they don't thrive on it and they find it more of a pulling them back where they probably have that freedom now. And then other players, they can only really perform where they perform best when they've got the crowd influence on them. So, yeah, it's a very strange time, um, but there's no doubt about it. It's It's not football. You know, it's not football in the sense of what we really know and what we love. You know, even as a manager stood on the side, not playing anymore, you know, I enjoy coming in front of a of a crowd with that pressure on me, you know, for your team to perform and and you're the one that gets the criticism or, or you can get praise. You know, I miss that pressure, um, whether good or bad. And I think, you know, I think any player really deep down, everyone misses it. So, yeah, it's, it is what it is. We're trying to, everyone's getting on with it. Everyone's trying to make the best of it. But you do notice a huge, huge difference, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you need to round up a few people at Hillsborough inside the stadium to boo you, really, don't you? Just to yeah. Well, I think we've got quite, we, we've got quite a noisy bench this year, so um, yeah. I mean, as a bench, you know, even the the guy, it's been something we talked about, you know, even the guys that are maybe substitutes, the players themselves, the staff, and everything like that. We're trying to be not loud to be just loud, but like make sure we have a bit of a spirit about us and you know, we're encouraging and pushing from the sidelines and that's everyone together. So, yeah, we're quite a loud bench this year. Yeah, well, uh, you hear them when you're at games and uh, I hear you at games and I've not heard you previously when there have been 20,000 people there. Yeah. And that has been interesting. Yeah. Uh, it really has. Um, just before we come on to aspects of let's get the fans in, those results I, I read, read out just now, they couldn't happen with the crowd. I mean, it's entertainment of a sort. And you could say, well, what fantastic entertainment. No crowd and we get those. But as you say, it's not the same. Funnily enough, the championship has not replicated that, has it? Do you, do you have any mm -hmm. thought as to why that is? Yeah, look, I don't know why. Um, I think the championship, as it's been said, it's, it's, for me, it's the most competitive league in the world in the sense of, there's so many different styles in, in this championship and it's so quite, you know, normally it's quite evenly matched majority of games. You'll get the odd game where you can win or lose by a, a bigger margin, but the majority of games are very tight games. They're very fine margins between most games. So that's probably what the championship's always been. And I don't really see a difference in that because, yeah, the quality is there or thereabouts most of the time. But, um, yeah, I think in terms of, like you said there, the crowd influence on it all. I think this season more than anything else, our fans will play a massive part in it. You know, I think at the situation we're in, um, the spirit of like, we've got to be on all of this together and that fight together. I think we can tell we've missed that already. Even though we've performed, you know, in all the games so far, we've been in positions in all these games to, to win those games. You know, we've created enough opportunities in those games to win those games or whatever. We, in terms of performance level, we've been, pretty good and consistent throughout, the, you know, I know it's only four league games, but we've been there or thereabouts with it. I think have we had the crowd in from the start, understanding the situation, where we're all at, that fight together, I think would have played, you know, a massive part in, in this season. So we're just really hopeful and, and desperately want them back in the stadium where I think they realise the situation we're in. And as well as it's been a difficult pass, especially the second half of last season, I've said it, you know, the past is the past now at this moment. The only thing that matters is what we do this season and what we're going to do moving forward. And I think they understand that and would have been a big part of it in terms of in the stadiums, even in the games that we played already. So um, hopefully we get them in as soon as possible. Yeah, it's uh, become a very uh, broad picture, hasn't it? The whole of football now is united behind that move to get fans back in the ground. They put enormous pressure on the government. Over 150,000 people have signed a petition. I don't know if you're one of them, but yeah. uh, <laughs> you've, certainly, you've cer certainly backed it. Why is it that the government have been so reluctant to allow this? Is it a lack of empathy with the sport and with football supporters? Because it strikes me that as a group across the country, they couldn't have been more patient or more tolerant. They've not massed outside grounds. 
they've behaved, kept a distance. What is it, do you think? What's the, what logical reason could there be to not allow a number of fans back? Um, uh, number one, I think it's in terms of football, I think it's the perception of football. I think, you know, we, we get drummed you know, 24 hours a day on, on Sky Sports or the media outlets. You know, it's the top end. We see these massive numbers that are spent on players and stuff like that. I think there's a perception of football that it's awash with money. And it's like that it just really isn't the case. And so I think in terms of the government view on, on football is they just think it's awash with, we've got, everyone's got a, a, a rich owner uh, or a board or whatever that may be and they can all afford it you know and I think the reality of football is the very very elite top end and even they have problems in this moment but okay maybe they can get through a, a longer period without that revenue but the majority of it, well if I'd say everyone in the EFL cannot do that it's like any business in life if you spend a year of your business without any revenue you're going to be in trouble and I think that goes across the whole EFL, especially, and the Premier League. You know, they're not immune to it. But I think it's the perception of football. Perception is football has a lot of money. It always has. It always will. And I think that's why the government kind of, you know, wash it aside and not help in that respect in terms of the financial part of it. But then in terms of not letting the crowd back in, I don't quite understand it. There's been so many rule changes. And, you know, I said to, I, was, I had something to eat with the, my wife. Was it yesterday? I said, like, you know, just these rules, like you would have to enter these places with a mask. And then as soon as you're in there, you can take your mask off when you sat down. I didn't, well, what's the, is COVID not in that 10 meters where I just walked to where I'm sat down? It's just, I don't understand it. And the thing is, I think clubs are so prepared now that, okay, we understand it's not going to be 20, 30, 40,000 walking straight back into a stadium, but that planned, you know, layer in it, maybe it was, you know, 2,000, then 5,000, then 10,000, whatever it is, I think it's doable, you know, it's, it's easily doable. I think there's, there's going to be a lot of protocols in place in terms of how they queue up and how they arrive at the ground and, do you know what I mean, how they enter the ground. I think it, that environment will be safe. But outside of it, of course, you can't control everything, but I don't see where it's any bigger risk than, like I said, me walking into a restaurant with my mask on and then 10 foot later, I'm taking it off to eat my meal. So uh, I don't see what, what the difference is. So... I don't know. Yeah. I think they're confused themselves. That's how I get it. I think we're all confused because it's, some stuff doesn't make sense. I think the government are in a difficult position because they know that they, they don't really want, this is my view personally, they don't want to lock it down again, but they can't please everyone. So they're kind of trying to find a way to put some rules there without shutting it all down. But it's all getting confusing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just before we leave that and sort of move on, because um, we're not going to solve it, that's, that's for sure. You use the word perception about wealth or alleged wealth in the game, which is confined mostly to the top end. Is there a perception of the football supporter as well, or as somebody who won't behave, can't be expected to behave, won't follow the rules? And if so, that strikes me as being very unfair. What, what do you think? I think quite possibly. I think that's society as well i think if you look at the lockdown um actual original lockdown that period i think the majority of the people in in, in britain and england especially i think they followed the rules you know and I think they showed you know i think the majority were sensible we heard cases and different things of people that weren't and stuff like that of course but the media you always hear that but i think the majority did do it i think until the dominic cummins situation where I think that's where people then just lost belief in what they were saying. And just that's when it started to go back to, you know, normal or people just disregarding certain things. So I think it's a society thing that they may be judging, but I think, yeah, football possibly could be that, but I just don't see it. If, if they see the plan in place, like as football, we're not expecting 30, 40,000 just to walk through the door straight away. We know that. And I think our fans know that every fan knows that, but what they want is to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't see any reason why, you know, 2,000 or 5,000 can't be coming to games or whatever it may be, you know, staggering it and then building it up and building it up. And then along that way, clubs will understand how to do whatever protocols they have in place now even better and even better. I think there's no more risk in doing that than there is, like I said, walking into a restaurant with a mask on or a supermarket and then taking it off 10 metres away from where you just went. And I, I just don't understand it. No, nor me. Absolutely not. I don't know anybody who does. Let's talk about you uh, for a minute and, 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 and your career. I think I'm right. Seven clubs played for. 
Uh, five clubs managed. That's mm. some going at the age of 41, isn't it? Well, to be fair, my career-wise, I only ever had... I was at three clubs, really, permanently. I only ever signed for three clubs. Um, talk, started my career at Torquay and then Southampton and then Swansea. But obviously, I had loans, especially at Southampton. Um, in that period, as you do as a young lad, you tend to go on loans, don't you, to gain that experience. That's really where the seven clubs comes from, which was great, the experience. But really, I've only had three clubs permanently. And then management, yeah, it's <laughs> definitely not by intention. And it's been a hell of an experience, but one that I've, I've really enjoyed and yeah I think I've, the experience that I've taken from all of those stuff good and bad and things like that has made me a, a, a better person a stronger manager and and um, yeah and keep trying to improve and that strive to improve is, is there it's in me so um, I've enjoyed it overall um, there's been some things that have yeah been very effective very harsh on myself and my family and stuff like that and things that that affect but it's all part of life and you grow stronger from it all that's my attitude and um and you just get on with on with it and keep trying to get better at it and that's what i'm where i'm at and i think that will always be with me to be honest with you first conversation we had i recall when you were appointed sheffield wednesday manager in september last year uh was that you were saying yeah you wanted to put down roots somewhere um you'd have these jobs in a short period of time but now well you're starting to put down uh, one or two roots there do you, do, do you feel that I just feel I just think and look this is you know take man, being a manager out, out of out of it for a second I think like anything in life like things don't get made overnight things don't get done I think the problem with and every manager will tell you this the problem is is time you don't get time now that I think it's moved so much towards, you know, the media in terms of pressure and the fans expectation of it. Everyone expects the finished product within five or six weeks of you taking over. They expect you to do a preseason and then it hits the ground running. And, and I've always said it, you know, like the pressure to win the results that, I, and don't get me wrong. I understand it. I accept it. I know what it's at, but I think you look at anything that's been successful. You look at, for instance, teams that have been promoted out of this league over the last, let's say, 10 years. I'd say 95% of those teams have spent two, three, four years building what they've been doing. Do you know what I mean? And building it and building it and getting closer and closer to it. And then they go up there and that's where they can sustain, you know, they've got a better chance of sustaining it. The teams that maybe have one year wonder and, and they do excellent and they get up there, they can't sustain it. You see often that they come straight back down. So logic tells you, as a person, forget being a manager, that... Time is what you need. You know, you can't just do it overnight. But as a manager now, knowing what the, the, the landscape looks like, you're trying to accelerate that and do that within a matter of weeks. And, and I understand that. And, and I just think that's the way football's gone. That's the way fans are. That's the way media are. Do you know what I mean? It sells, doesn't it? You know, the media, it sells. You know, it's, it's, um, it is what it is. You know, I think people talk about if you don't win within five games, people talk. I remember learning that experience really quickly at, at Swansea. I, had a great first probably 16 months or whatever it may be. And we were finished eighth in the league. We were done the double over Man United, Arsenal, all these great things and broke record, all those things. And then started the next season off really well. And then it came one period where we didn't win in five games. I think we drew two or three of them. So we didn't even lose them. Well, I can't remember totally, but I remember five games and talk had already started in the media. Monk under pressure and this and that. And that was my first experience of it. And I thought, wow. Just like that five games has been in a matter of two weeks. Again, if you yeah. apply it to business, if your business had a bad two weeks, would you sack every single member of staff or you wouldn't do it, would you? But in football, it's different, you know? So yeah. I, I just remember that's my first experience of management of the harshness of it and the, the cruel side of it where, yeah, if you don't win in a matter of games that could even be like two weeks, you, you're under pressure. And I think it's just a case of, I don't really focus on it. You know, I understand it now and I understand that's what it is. If I'm honest with you, I don't waste my energy on worrying about losing. I don't do these. I don't do this because, I, you know, I fear losing a job. I do it because I love doing it and I want to do it. And I feel like I've got something to offer. So I just keep my mind on that. And the rest is what it is. You understand it. But yeah, all of it in football landscape isn't really conducive to giving you time to build something. But that's what it is. That's just the job. Yeah, Swansea, I looked at that 
today, and I think I'm right in saying that Swansea were 15th in the Premier League when you were sacked. 15th in the Premier League. Let's repeat that. Um, I mean, going back some years to something I remember, Sheffield Wednesday were 13th in the Premier League when Trevor Francis uh, was sacked. So we can go on with these. I also note that at Leeds United, which is as challenging as a job as they come, particularly in the circumstances in which you were there, which are rather different to the ones now, you had a win ratio of 47.2%. So, I mean, these things should be put out there when people sort of say, oh, he's out, he hasn't got much of a record in management. You know, I've, I've seen people say that. And that's possibly because you've moved around so much, but not always because you wanted to. Mm. Oh, but look, look my, I've got no worries in saying my ambition as a manager is I was very lucky as a player where I managed to achieve promotions. I've said it all along, my aim as a manager, I'd love to have a promotion on my CV and I'd love to have a championship promotion to the Premier League. I've, I've always said that to have that as a player and then have that as a manager would be, is something that it's not my end goal, but it's, it's my big goal in, in my mind, you know, and I think it's a case of you're right. At the end of the day, I think we live in a world, a lot of it is negative. I think there's a lot of people that want to be negative. I don't worry about that. I don't waste energy on it. I think, like you said, I'm proud of the jobs that I've done. Do you know what I mean? I think Middlesbrough is probably the only one where in terms of time frames, I wasn't allowed to really even get started or get going, you know, even though we were still in a, a really healthy position. I think I was like the fourth, third or fourth highest win ratio of the in the history of the club, all those things, that was the one where I didn't really get going on it or wasn't allowed to get going on it. But you're right. I look at Leeds, I think taking that club from where it was to where, to what we did, you know, I, they were saying to me the other day, I think it was the points tally we ended up with was over the course of the last 10, 15 years, that would have made the playoffs. I think it was 13 times out of the last 15. It just happened on that one season. It was a, a high number for the playoffs. And it's like Birmingham took them from, certain relegation to then steady mid-table. Even that season we were there, we were very close to the playoffs and then just dropped away at the end. So I'm very proud of the jobs I've done. Do you know what I mean? I think in terms of what success looks like, everyone will judge it on the ultimate things, promotions and trophies and things like that. But in terms of the jobs that I've been involved with, I think taking them from where they were, where you picked them up to where you finished with them, we've progressed every single one of them. So I'm, I'm very yeah. satisfied with that. It's not enough. It's not where I want to be ultimately, but mm. in terms of, you know, success and progression, I've managed to achieve that. So I'm proud mm. of that. I'm proud of all those jobs. And I want to do the same here. I want to take from where I've taken it, picked it up from. And yeah, I'm, we've had a rough patch in that second half of the season, but I want to look into this season, especially with this situation is to try and make it feel more successful and that we're moving forward as a club. That's what I want to do. That's my whole energy and my hunger is for, is for that. So that's what I'm focused on. Well, as we uh, close uh, part one, can I put it to you that you're now into your second year as Sheffield Wednesday manager? And I would say that's not an inconsiderable achievement in itself. <laughs> when you look at the statistics and the record, um, yeah. <laughs> funny as well, like you, you mentioned the amount of clubs that I've been through um, in terms of management, but actually I think the someone was saying to me again the other day, I don't pay too much attention to it all, but I think all my tenures apart from Middlesbrough are above the average for a manager. It's, it's, really? it's, it's, it's incredible. Like the, the climate that we work in as managers now in terms of timeframes um, to think that I think apart from Middlesbrough, the, all my tenures are above the actual average of a manager, um, you know, from the normal, which is just, yeah. it's just absolutely incredible. Isn't it? When you think of it like That's that. It's, it's, it's utterly crazy. Uh, I don't want to put you off, but I've worked with about 45 managers yeah. in Sheffield football uh, on both sides of the city in yeah. as many years. Uh, yeah. You're sort of ahead of the game, can I? Can I say? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of the game still to play. We've got a lot of the show still to do in terms of Gary's plans at, uh, at Hillsborough. Also, James Gregg will join us uh, because sport is taking place across the region. It's important we recognise that on this programme. So thanks for watching. It's only half time. Uh, do rejoin us for part two.